Good morning, everyone. And welcome to my talk about um, throwing tools at ranges. So ever since I talked about how to rangeify your code, I got asked a lot how ranges impact the runtime performance of the code. And I benchmarked the code um, of my last talk a little bit, <clears throat> but I thought it might be a little bit more interesting to go more into detail <coughs> and also using maybe some different tools. And so here we are. This talk has an outline. Um, we're going to start by, um, I'm going to start by um, talking about the setup that I used to create um, the output and the results. <clears throat> Next, I'm going to explain the code that we're analyzing. Um, and because I need to compare the range's output to something, otherwise it would be quite boring, I wrote the exact same example in what I call C-style C++. C++17, where I use algorithms, and C++23, where I use ranges. Um, all of these examples do the exact same thing, and then we're um, looking at the Google benchmark output, um, cache grid, and Visual Studio Profiler. While I have used the Visual Studio Profiler before, I'm fairly new to the Linux tools because I mainly work on Windows machines. But for you, the experience might be the other way around. And uh, the presentation of the Visual Studio Profiler will be a live demo, so I hope this will be okay. Um, and after we looked at the output of the tools, we're actually going to optimize the code um, in all of the three versions, and then run some of the tools again, and in the end, I will tell you what I learned um, about this. So let's start with the setup. As I said before, I'm a Windows user. I always have been. And um, I am at work also mainly developing on Windows. So I never really had the inclination to learn the Linux tools or yeah, Linux, Linux itself. Um, you might already be guessing that I used AWSL um, to do the Linux stuff on Windows. So the WSL2 is a virtual machine or similar to a virtual machine that runs Ubuntu by default. And you can install it on your Windows machine, and then you can use it like a Linux machine. You can install all your Linux tools and run them. And um, it's uh, also linked to your, um, to your Windows computer. So you can access like the file system from the WSL, the Windows file system from the WSL, um, or the other way around. So that's very convenient for me as a Windows user to have like all the Windows tools available. Um, and also, an interesting thing might be my computers. So this is my laptop. This is the current laptop that I'm um, presenting here. And as you can see, this is not built to do any kind of hard work. Like, it's not even built to do any kind of work. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it works for stuff like this. Um, but we are going to run the Visual Studio Profiler on this laptop, just to keep that in mind. And this is my main PC. This is my ridiculously overpowered PC that I have at home for gaming and stuff. And uh, as you can see, this is a little bit more powerful. And so I run the Google benchmark and the cache grid um, on this computer. So just for comparison. And now I'm going to show you the code. Um, I wanted to find an example where I can use as many C23 ranges as possible. But it turns out that there's not really a real life code example that I could use or rewrite um, for this, or it would have taken me um, way too long. So I made up an example, which basically is nonsense code, but it uses um, a lot of the C20, um, 20, 20, and 23 ranges. Um, yeah. So the code itself is not supposed to make sense. It's just supposed to use as many views as possible from the ranges. And also when I wrote the example for um, C++23, the compilers did not yet support all of the new views. So I used range v3 in, in this version. So hopefully in the future, I can switch to the standard library and do the uh, comparison again. And to mimic some kind of real life function, I wrote three subfunctions, which also makes it easier than for the profiling um, to see which one of the subfunctions is the slowest or fastest. 
And I will go, um, I hope this will not be too confusing, I will go over the sub-functions like one by one and compare the different versions. I'm not going to spend too much time on the code itself, um, but I uploaded it to GitHub. So when you get the slides later, this is linked in this logo, and then you can hop over and look at the code yourself. So we will start with the C++ 23 version. So this is the version that uses the ranges. Um, we start with a view that I really like, which is Cartesian product. And it can be confusing at the beginning because it has the name product in it and you think might be there's some multiplication going on, but it's just combining all of the ranges into, uh, yeah, with each other basically. So you can view it as a nested loop. So everything you put into Cartesian product um, would be a huge nested loop where you loop over the first range and then the second range and then the third range or how many you want to have. <clears throat> and then you get a tuple with all of these elements and then you can do something with that like you would do in your um, nested loop um, um, body. So um, the first range that I'm using in Cartesian product is a vector that is inputted into the function. Then I have an iota view which starts at one and counts to four, just to have more ranges in there. Um, and then I use the input range again, but I'm going to transform it. I'm going to square the values and add two. As I said, it does not make sense. It's just to have some uh, modification of the input range. And um, yeah, when we close the brackets here, we created this Cartesian product. And this is a new view. And this view contains the tuples of all the combined elements. And no, nothing has been done with this range yet. So now you have to tell this huge range what you want to do with it. And you do that by using a transform view. And this transform view um, here accepts a, uh, expects a tuple. I don't like tuples, so I deconstruct them um, using structured bindings. And then I do some calculation. Um, again, it's just doing some calculation. Also, the names, as you can see, are not, not good because it's nonsensical. And um, what I'm returning from this function is a view. And this is very important. So if you're not familiar with ranges, views are lazy. So at this point, when you call this function, um, it has not been evaluated yet because you don't, no one, um, yeah, the, the program hasn't uh, accessed the values of this output range yet. So um, once you have this in some kind of um, evaluation state, like in a, a for loop where you want to output the values, for example, um, then it will get evaluated. So this is very important to keep in mind for ranges. So when you're using views, they are lazy. So um, compared to like the algorithms which are evaluated eagerly. And now we're doing the exact same thing in C++17. And uh, thankfully we have a lot of algorithms, but in this case, I haven't found an algorithm that will do the nested loop stuff for me. So I have to write a huge nested loop, but I'm using, uh, yeah, this is um, the output. So in this case, I'm returning a vector for my output and not a view, um, and also I'm using range base four. I'm looping over the um, outer range, then I just made an array with these indices that I created before with the iota view, and then I'm looping over the inner range, and here I'm doing the calculation that we had in the transform. And that's basically it. So, um, if, if this is too fast, that's okay. The, the code itself is not that important, um, but it needs to be there so you can review it later um, in detail if you want to. And for the C style C++, it's basically the same as uh, the C++17, but we're going to use um, index loops and also in pure C style fashion, I'm going to use new <laughs> to allocate some memory on the heap. And then I have my index loops. Um, doing the same work here, just index-based. And then I'm returning 
my uh, dynamic array here. Um, the second function is a bit um, smaller. I really, really wanted to use zip width, which is called zip transform in a standard library. So if you're looking to transform this to the standard library, there it's called zip transform. And um, so this is a new view that went into C23. And it's very handy and it allows you to loop over different ranges at once. It would be the same um, as you would do if you have a for loop, a range-based for loop, and then you call zip and zip together your, your ranges. If you're familiar with Python, <clears throat> um, then you, you already know how this kind of loop works. And the first argument for zip width or zip transform is the lambda that you are going to apply to the elements. So here I'm just dividing um, the values. And then this is a variadic template, so you can input in as many ranges as you want to. So getting some kind of input range. And I did an iota view again. This view starts at the value 10 and it has no end. And that's okay in this case because zip, um, zip width and zip transform, they terminate at the shortest range. So the shortest range here is the input range and I don't need to know the size of this range to call the iota view here in the zip width. So I think that's really handy. Um, when I want to write this in C++17, um, again, I'm defining my output. Um, as you have, maybe you have seen any talk of mine before, this is my usual pattern. I create some kind of vector, fill it with something, and then return the vector. Um, doing the same here, but we're using transform, and since we're on C17, we don't have the range-based version yet, so um, I need to use the iterators um, with that one. And then um, with transform, I'm going to do the same kind of calculation. So I optimized away the second range here and just used an index, count the index. And C style, um, again, some new uh, memory on the heap and index loop because what else? And we're doing the same kind of calculation. And then the third function, um, I put in even more ranges. Um, so I wanted to use as many views, or as many new views as possible. So I'm using partial sum here. And um, you might know partial sum sums up all the values in your range up until the index of the range. Um, this is a uh, yeah. <clears throat> this is a temporary result, and in this case, again, this is a view. So nothing has been evaluated at this point. Also, the second function returned a view. So at this point, the code hasn't done anything yet. Just declared how we want to have our values. And then I have a simple, simple a second temporary, and I'm using the sliding view with uh, the window of two. I could have used pairwise for this as well. So pairwise is the exact same thing as sliding with a window of two. And this will create a subrange with two values of the, uh, of the input range. And then you can do something with the two values. So um, yeah, it's, it's adjacent values, basically. Um, but you can have like um, any number of uh, elements in the sliding view, which is very handy. And this creates a subrange. And then I'm calling transform again on the subrange and just do some, com some kind of calculation on the subrange. And in the end, I actually want to calculate something. So now I need to call um, something that actually calculates something. And I decided that I want to use inner product. So inner product multiplies all the values of the ranges together and then sums everything up. Um, and since my first uh, range is one element shorter than the second range because we're using the sliding view of two, so that makes the range one element shorter, I'm going to drop the first element. So they are now the same size. And inner product will actually evaluate the ranges and do all of the calculation. And this function then returns a double with the inner product in the end. For C17, um, I did 
the same, but I used, um, again, vectors, and I used the C++17 algorithms for that. So the partial sum is the partial sum. The um, sliding window of two is adjacent difference, which in this case is not the best name for this algorithm because you don't have to calculate a difference with adjacent difference. You can give it a, a lambda and you can do anything you want with the two adjacent elements. Um, it's only an appropriate name if you don't give it a lambda that, do some, that does something else. So in this case, the name might be confusing for the algorithm, but it's doing the same thing and it's very handy if you want to do something with adjacent elements. Doing the same calculation. And then um, also we have in a product in the standard library. Here it's the um, iterator-based version. And as far as I know, we're not having a range-based version for that one. Um, but we couldn't use it in C17 anyways. And uh, C style is a little bit bigger. It's the same fashion. Um, I have some temporary output, um, again, on the heap with new, which is scary. <laughs> uh, and then I have some index loops that are doing the, the calculations. And um, yeah, this is the same thing, but in loops. So the first one is the partial sum. The second one is the thing with the adjacent elements. And then I have the... Um, in a product, I need to delete my temporaries, it's very important, and nothing goes wrong until this delete, I made sure, <laughs> and then I return the sum. And then in the end, I'm just calling the functions. So I have these three sub-functions, um, I get some kind of um, vector of doubles as input, and um, I'm calling the first function with a vector, I'm calling the second function with the first view, and I'm calling the third function with both of the views. Same with C17, so it's the same order. And then C style, again, we have some new in there, so we also need to delete um, our, our data. And that's it for the code. Um, as I said, if you couldn't really follow, um, because it's not like a real life, um, problem that you can actually reason about, um, you can review the, the code later. So when I want to compare, um, or yeah, when I want to compare these different versions of the code, I like to use Google Benchmark. It's a super simple tool, uh, very easy to set up, and it's platform independent. So I can use it on Windows. Um, so if you want to benchmark your functions, you write a static void function that accepts a benchmark state as an argument. Then you do all your setup that you don't want to benchmark. Then you write a loop over the state. Then you do all the stuff that you want to benchmark. Um, here I used um, also a feature from benchmark which is called do not optimize. And um, that's because compilers tend to be very smart. And I'm calculating the double here, but I'm not using the double anywhere. And there is a chance that a compiler optimized the entire function call away because I'm not using the result. So that's why I use do not optimize here, so it doesn't get thrown away. Then you have to register your benchmark with a benchmark macro. Here I changed the output to milliseconds because the default is nanoseconds, and it's just a huge number, and I don't like to read huge numbers, so I made milliseconds. And then you call the benchmark main <clears throat> macro, which encapsulates the main function and calls all the, the benchmark stuff. And that is everything you have to set up for Google Benchmark. So that's why it's so easy to use. And you can use all your different versions of the functions at once and benchmark them at once. So that's what I did. This is the output. So the C style version is um, on 25 milliseconds. C17 is on 35 seconds, uh, milliseconds. And the C23 is a little bit off the rail with um, 300 milliseconds, but that's actually because of a problem in the code, and we're going to fix the problem. So, um, yeah, and we're going to optimize all of the, the different versions, so not just the C23 one. So, next up is cache current. I always wanted to learn Valgrind, 
Well, not really, but um, <laughs> I thought that might be interesting um, to look at the cache um, layout of the different versions of the code because I've never seen that done before with the, with the ranges. So just to see if the ranges are like cache efficient. So CacheGrind is a performance profiling tool which is part of Valgrind. And um, um, so it is there to, to optimize the cache usage of the program. Um, it simulates the behavior of the processor's cache hierarchy, and uh, it, is, yeah, it provides some insights into how the program utilizes the cache. And uh, so you can identify performance bottlenecks with that. So I uh, run CacheGrind. This is a command line tool for Linux. And you should build the code in release mode, so optimized and with debug symbols if you want to analyze the output any further. I will go over the output of cache print line by line so you know what all of the uh, weird numbers are. And we're starting here with the C style version. Um, yeah, the, the first block contains the instruction cache statistics. And the instruction cache. Um, contains the instructions to actually execute the program. Um, when the processor needs an instruction, to um, uh, it checks the, the lowest level cache first, so the level one cache, and um, this is the fastest to access. And if it finds uh, the instruction there, it's called a cache hit, and it doesn't if it doesn't find the instruction there, then it's called a cache miss. And you want to have as little cache misses as possible, because if you have a cache miss, then the program needs to fetch some instructions from the main memory, and that is slow. <clears throat> so here I have the overall um, reference that were made, instruction reference that were made in the program. Um, I have some cache misses for the level one and also the last level cache. And the miss rate is 0%, which is a good score. And then um, we have the uh, data cache statistics. And um, data cache also has this hierarchy of level one cache, um, two and three. And um, the data cache stores the data that is needed to execute the program. <clears throat> so if the program needs to read or write some data, it checks the lowest level caches first. And if it doesn't find the data there, it goes to the main memory, fetches the data, and then it can continue on with the calculation. And again, this is the slow part. So fetching the, the data from main memory is the slow part. This is also um, divided into read and write um, uh, references. So if you need to like optimize for that. And um, here again for the output, we have the overall um, data references that were made in the program. We have the level one misses last level misses, and then we have a miss rate in percent. And as you can see here, um, the miss rate in percent is actually quite high. So we're trying to see if we can optimize that. And the last block is the last level cache statistics. And the last level cache refers to the highest level cache in like a multi-level cache hierarchy. Um, it, is the smallest, uh, the, the, it's the largest of the caches, but the slowest of the caches. Um, and it also combines the instruction cache and the data cache. Um, overall, the last level cache plays a crucial role in improving the performance by reducing the overall um, access, um, overall time to access the data from main memory. And then at the very end, we have some uh, branches. Um, and this block is the statistics about the branch prediction. So the first line tells us um, uh, the total number of branches that were made in the program. And it further breaks down to conditional and indirect branches. So a conditional branch is a change in the program's execution flow. And that happens typically if you have a if statement or if you have a for loop um, where you have some kind of condition and then you break out and you do something else. Um, yeah, depending on the condition of the, uh, yeah, in the program, 
um, it has to jump to a different location in, in the program. So, And indirect branches involve jumps to different addresses in the register. And this is typically done by um, calling functions or using virtual function dispatch, jump tables, and stuff like that. <laughs> So the next line indicates the number of branch mispredictions that occurred during the program and also the uh, misprediction rate in percent. So a branch misprediction happens when the processor's branch prediction mechanism predicts the wrong branch outcome. Um, mispredictions are bad for the performance because um, the um, instructions that were already fetched are not being used. They need to be discarded and the um, program has to go into the main memory and fetch the right kinds of instructions. So that's why branch mispredictions are bad for performance. Um, with modern C++, you can try to optimize branch prediction, but I never did that, so I have no experience on that. And so we haven't really looked at the numbers yet, um, but as I said before, the data miss rate is not good um, for, for this example, but all of the other stats are actually quite good. Uh, really good, actually. It's, um, yeah. And now we're going to compare this output to the C++17 version and the C++23 version. We're not going into this detail again. It's just that you know what um, all of these weird numbers are. Um, this slide is here to give you an overview if you get the slide deck later. So um, you don't have to memorize any numbers from the slide before and compare them in your head. Um, I'm going to do that for you. Um, this is the output for C23. Again, this is to have the entire output in the slide deck. And I have a comparison slide, so you don't have to memorize the numbers. And uh, as we can see, the C style C++ created the lowest number of instruction references, and C++23 is really high, which also correlates to um, the runtime, which is really uh, slow for the C++23 version. Um, yeah, but also instruction refs are not 100% linked to performance. So you can have a lot of instructions, but it doesn't mean that your program is slow. In this case, it correlates, but it doesn't have to. Um, what I found interesting is that the total number of um, uh, cache misses are the same through all of the uh, examples. And also miss rate for all of them is then zero. Data refs, again, for C, um, C23 are the most data refs, but the the ref misses are extremely low. And I thought, or, yeah, I, I, I reasoned about it, and I thought that the um, reason for that is that the ranges are evaluated lazily. So there is not a lot of data in um, the memory um, apart from the input range that we're inputting into the, into the function. So every time in inner product, in the very last um, function, we need a value, it will get calculated, like throughout all of the views that we calculate, uh, that we specified. And so there's no need to fetch more memory uh, or more data from memory because we only need this one um, value from the input range and we have it all right there. And so that makes um, the mispredicts for the data really low because we don't need we don't have like any temporaries that we need to fetch again that is stored somewhere in main memory. Again, miss rate is really high for um, C star C++. And last level cache refs are also extremely low for the C++23 version. And I think that's um, for the same reason as, um, as the data refs are very low. Because we don't have to um, have to read a lot of data back in from the main memory. Um, the last level cache doesn't have to do um, a lot of things here. Um, branches are quite high for C17. Don't know why. <laughs> um, it's not a problem if um, the branches are high. 
um, as long as the mispredicts are not high. So, um, but I found it interesting that this um, C++ um, 17 version created lots of branches. It might be because of the algorithms and some more boundary checkings in there, but I'm not sure. Um, again, the total number of mispredicts for all of these are the same. So I found that interesting as well. And these would be the numbers I would try to concentrate on um, for optimizing. Again, the number of branches are not really a problem um, for the C++ 17 one, but uh, it's it just stands out. So. And now we are going to a live demo. I'm going to use the Visual Studio Profiler. I cannot give you like a full tutorial of the profiler. It's too large, it does a lot of things, um, but I can show you um, what I am doing with it. So. so I have my program here. Is it big enough or should I make it bigger? Okay. So I have my program here. Um, this is my solution. This is all of the files that I have. I just tuck them away. And um, I build in release mode because if you want to do um, performance profiling, you should profile um, like you would actually use the program. So in release mode. And then you go to debug, performance profiler, and then you can start your profiling. So the first tab here is the project that you want to profile. I made a Visual Studio project for this um, on purpose because it's just easier. It's, it, it will just run the Visual Studio project in the profiler. But you can, as you can see, you can profile like almost anything, a running process, an executable, an app. Um, also works with um, a CMake project. So um, that's, that's not an issue. It's just easiest with a Visual Studio project. I've never used any other tool than the CPU usage. So I cannot tell you anything about the other ones. And that's why we're going to hit start. So what I like about Visual Studio and like the tools it comes with is that it's all integrated. I don't like to go into the shell and executing some stuff and then using another program to analyze the stuff and going back and forth. So um, after I have this output created here, I can actually jump into the code right in Visual Studio. I'm not paid by Microsoft, by the way, <laughs> but I'm open to offers. Um, yeah, we, we get some statistics here. So uh, at the top, you see this run for, ran for um, 3.6 seconds. Um, we have like a pie chart here that tells us the time in the kernel and the runtime and something it couldn't quite figure out. And for the C++ stuff, everything we do is kernel. Um, the the runtime stuff is here starting up like the app. And the app is, is like nothing. It's like a command line tool, and I'm not even outputting anything. Um, if you have a managed um, language like um, C Sharp, and you're going to use the profiler in that, then you have um, like different statistics for runtime, which is the C Sharp runtime, the .NET runtime. And then you have the kernel where, where the calculations are happening. But we are C++, we are all kernel. Um, so I don't find this pie chart too, too helpful in this case. And then we have here an overview of the top functions and the hot path. And what I typically do is I just click on one of those. Doesn't matter. And then I'm going to switch the view to a flame graph because I like fire. And in the flame graph, you can see the relations a little bit better um, from uh, the, the functions that were actually called. So as you can see, the first and the second sub functions, we don't spend a lot of time in there, but we st spend a lot of time in the third uh, sub function. And we can click in there, which I really like. It also just the zoom here. And then you can see how much time it's spent in the different loops. So that's what I find really handy about the Visual Studio Profiler. So you have everything in place. It's all interactive. You can um, click around if you want to. And yeah, I'm not really going into um, this stuff. This is just some, some uh, pointer in the, in the data 
or um, standard library stuff. Not using standard library here, but it could be library stuff. So it's it's not too helpful to look into those unnamed things. Um, I'm going to um, always look into the named functions that I actually wrote. So um, now, how do we optimize this function? This is actually a quite easy fix, um, because if you look closely, all of these loops go from 1 to n, or 0 to n minus 1. So we can squeeze everything into one big loop, and that gets rid of the temporary outputs that I created here. And um, yeah, it also speeds up the runtime, because we're doing everything in one loop and not in three loops. So, we're doing that. The first one um, is the partial sum. And I, it just went as part of the loop. So, in initializing the first value of the partial sum, I went into the loop. Again, I'm not spending too much time on the code itself. If you want to figure out what I did there, then you, you can look into the code later. Um, then the second loop was the adjacent elements um, calculation stuff. So that went into the new loop body. And then the last one is the inner product. And basically everything merged into that loop. And so we're doing the calculation here. And this is my optimized version of the program that used um, three loops before with um, two temporary um, vectors, um, arrays. And now we have everything in one loop. Um, we're going to run um, the tools again uh, in a second, so you can see how this changed the runtime of the program. So now we're doing the same thing with the C17 code. I hit debug, performance profiler, and start. It's fairly fast, even on that computer. Um, yeah, you can see it's the same kind of output we ran for um, 2.7 seconds here. Um, like, this is not... Um, yeah, this is not really benchmarking, so you cannot really rely on the numbers here. As you saw, the C, the C style is actually faster um, on the Google benchmark, but this ran faster in this profiler. So I'm not really um, looking too much at the time that it spent here. We have our top functions again and the hot path, and we'll just click somewhere and again change the flame graph. Um, because I think it's, it's more readable. And then here we actually have um, the, like the main function of the C17 version. And here you can see it spends the most time again in the third function. Um, it's like 60% of the time, and the other time it spends in the, in the other functions. And here at the top you see again the distribution of the execution of these functions. You can also click in there again and see where it spends its time, but it's fairly well distributed through all of the algorithms. And when we want to optimize that, we basically do the same thing as we did for the C style version. So the main problem is that we have some temporaries and we do everything in three loops. So the algorithms are just loops um, in, in the background. Um, and that is slowing us down. So um, I sacrifice readability for speed. And I did this. And instead of using a for loop, I'm going to use accumulate. Um, because partial sum in the end is also just an accumulate of the uh, uh, product of some, uh, the sum of the product of two ranges. Um, so this is the entire optimization that I did for the C17 version, like for, for the first round of optimizations. And it looks 
pretty similar to the um, Z style C++. Yeah, um, as I said, I sacrificed readability a little bit, but hopefully I gained some runtime speed. And now we're moving to C++23. As I said, I'm using range v3 here, so it's not the standard library, but I hope the standard library will, will be similar than when I'm going to use it. And now this looks different. <laughs> um, the problem with profiling stuff like that is that I used range v3 for everything. So what we're profiling basically is the range v3 library. And that is super hard to read, at least for me. So I can click into that one also in the flame graph. As you can see, it's just some locations in range v3 where here in inner product, which actually makes a lot of sense that we're spending the most time in inner product because, as I said, the ranges are lazy. So inner product is the only time we evaluate the values of the ranges, of the views, and therefore we spend all of the computation time in inner product. So that makes sense. But uh, again, yeah, we're here also in a product. Um, by the way, I saw it at the, at the top here that we're in inner product. Yeah, so this is the output that we're getting. And I don't know if you find that helpful. I don't. <laughs> so I had no idea what's going on. So I went back and did something that I usually don't really do for, for performance profiling, but I did the same thing in debug mode. Debug mode does not give you a realistic um, like um, performance overview of your program, but it can help you by not optimizing away a lot of stuff to maybe see some patterns. And that's what I prepared here. Um, the debug session is like five minutes, so I prepared that before the talk. And again, I'm just clicking somewhere it, the output doesn't change too much from readability. Uh, yeah, again, we're spending all of the time in this function, so I would have figured. And um, then we can click into here, and we see we spend all of our time in inner product. So this is a little bit more helpful than we had before with the optimized version. Um, but it makes sense that we're spending all of the time in a product. But now, why is this thing so slow? Um, I didn't really have a clue until I looked at all of these long names. And these long names are because I'm piping together like the, the views. So I have like the Cartesian view and the transform and then um, some, uh, the, the partial sum and, you know, chaining together all of these views and that creates this huge type that you cannot read. Um, but you can maybe spot some patterns. So what I saw here is the Cartesian product and I went to the partial sum and I saw the um, Cartesian product as well. And then I went to here and saw the Cartesian product again and so, like, it, it, it was just everywhere. And also, like, in, in parallel. So these functions are executed in parallel. So I thought to myself, why are we calculating the Cartesian product, which is, again, a nested loop. It's a huge nested loop. Why are we calculating this so often? And that's because I made a... Uh, I, I fall into a pit hole. Um, yeah, in a pit hole. Um, what's it called? Um, for, uh, for ranges. And I'm going to show you. So the first function here returns, this is the Cartesian product, it returns a view. And then I'm going back and I am inputting the view into the second function, which also returns a view. And then I'm going to evaluate both of them in, in a product. So the second range depends on the first range. 
And because of that, it calculates the Cartesian product again, because it has not been evaluated at this point. It's all just a huge view. It's um, like telling the, the program what it should do with the values. Um, yeah, but it hasn't been evaluated at this point. So when we evaluate both of these ranges in, in our product, we actually evaluate the Cartesian product twice. And that's what's slowing us down. And the fix for that is super easy. So again, this is where we call the, um, the functions, uh, the, the relation of the, of the inputs. And now we, we need to make sure that this Cartesian product is only evaluated once. And the only way to do this um, is to um, store it somewhere. Um, like to trigger the actual execution of this, um, of this view. And I do that by using one of my favorite features, range two, and I'm storing all the output in a vector. And now this function does not return a view, it returns a vector. And I'm going to put the vector into the other function that again creates a huge view, but all of the computation for the Cartesian product has already been done. So now we can use the results um, that we did for that. And when we benchmark this, now we have some different values. The C style is almost twice as fast as it was before. C++ 17 as well, it's still slower than the C style, but it's also twice as fast almost as before. And now my favorite benchmark, the um, C++ 23 one is now the fastest, or it's at least, a, it's, it's mostly the same as the C style. So. Um, so we sped that up a lot by just making sure that we're evaluating the Cartesian product only once, which again is a nested loop, so it takes a lot of time. So when we look at the cash grant output, again, you don't have to remember any values from before. I'm going to compare them. Um, so this is the complete output, this is the comparison. So um, we lowered the overall instructions. This is always good. And um, I wanted to um, improve the data miss rates. I did a little bit. So the overall data refs are meant, went down, but yeah, the misses are still at 15%. I'm not quite sure why this is happening. Um, need to figure this out a little bit more. Um, also last level, um, cache stuff went down, which makes sense because we um, got rid of like the two temporary um, arrays. So there's not much, uh, so there's less work um, to, uh, less data to fetch from main memory. And branches also went down, which makes sense because we reduced the three um, uh, loops into one loop. So that reduces the overall branches of the program. This is the overview of C17. And if we compare them, we also improved the instruction refs. Um, data refs also went down. Um, the percentage of the misses are the same. Uh, last level cache also went down. Again, this has to do with getting rid of the temporary um, vectors and um, also getting rid of um, two of the loops. And I reduced the branches a little bit. Um, Again, it's not really a problem because the mispredicts are at zero percent, but um, yeah, it, it's still a high, um, a high number. And this is the C plus plus twenty three output. And as you can see, we really improved the instruction refs that we created in the program. Overall misses and so are like the same through all of the examples. Um, data refs went down a lot but we increased the, the data misses. And that's because we now have a temporary vector that is stored in main memory and we need to fetch the data. We need to write the data, we need to fetch the data. That's unfortunate, but still, um, it, it's still a good score. And also we do now, again, more work in the last level cache. Again, this is because we introduced um, some data in the main memory and we need to fetch that when we do the, uh, the calculation. 
branches also went down. And when we compare, now we compare all of the three versions, I have a winner for the C style version, which is the instruction refs. Again, here you can see now it doesn't necessarily correlate to the runtime performance. So C style and C23 are the same, or um, 23 is a little bit um, faster. Um, but it has more instruction refs than the C style version. So for data refs, um, C style and C23 win because 23 has the lowest amount of misses, but C style has the lowest data refs overall. And for last level cache, C23 for me wins. There's the less, less work there. And branches, um, so branches are very low, um, the amount of branches are very low in the um, C style. So what I would do next is to run like the profiler again, see if, if the performance is not good enough yet and see where I can improve this uh, further. Maybe use some different tools um, to like actually figure out why the data misses, uh, data ref misses are so high for the C-style version. Um, but we're almost out of time, so we're not doing that. And yeah, now to the conclusion. So um, what I really liked um, was that I learned how to actually work with the WSL and using the Linux tools on, on Windows. So um, if you're doing cross-platform work, I would actually recommend um, you to do that. Um, it's very easy to set up, so even I could do this. Um, yeah, there are things to look out for for all of these versions of the code that you're writing. Like the um, pitfalls for the C style versions are different than the pitfalls of the um, ranges version. And for ranges, you really have to keep in mind that all of these things, um, that the views, not all of them, but the views are evaluated lazily. And then you need to figure out um, if you're maybe creating a situation like I did, where you're evaluating the same views multiple times. Um, yeah, but as you saw, um, the performance for the C23 version, I think is really, really good without sacrificing the readability. And when I optimize the other versions, I sacrifice a lot of readability. Um, but I also cannot deny that like, profiling this library code stuff is not fun at all. So it, just by chance, I caught that the Cartesian product is just um, appearing everywhere. Um, yeah, and lastly, if you have like, um, you, you cannot only use one tool for analysis of this stuff. So you have to use different tools and look at the different aspects or, um, to actually analyze the code and trying to um, actually optimize what you want to optimize. Yeah, I kind of like ranges. So do you have any questions? <laughs> 